Last week, I preached and scared some of you uh, when I climbed the ladder on what it meant to be a church for imperfect people. Anyone remember that? Anyone enjoy that message? Uh, I had great feedback this week of people feeling free. Also, people misinterpreting my sermon, and we are a church that uh, vapes. Apparently, that was the misinterpretation. <laughs> I just want to make it clear, vaping, it will kill you quicker, and we don't want our leaders to do it. Just want to throw that out there in case you misinterpret what a church for imperfect people means. But we basically talked about the difference between your position seated in the heavenly realms and your position on your sanctification journey. The moment you find Jesus, you are seated with Jesus in the heavenly realms. You follow him. Uh, you cannot earn that position. It's because of what Jesus did. But the moment you follow Jesus, you change your direction, remember? You change your direction and you begin to walk on your journey following Jesus. And that journey will have ups and it will have downs. But what's important is not your position on that journey, but it's the direction that you're facing. As long as you're facing in the right direction and you keep on moving, that is what God is after. And so today I want to talk about another tagline in our church. There was many people that were drawn to our church because they saw this church for imperfect people. But as well, we, we had this other tagline that we just came up with in our church. And a lot of people were drawn to it as well. And it's simply this. It's the church, uh, sorry, it's the family that you've been looking for. Nine years next month, Kate and I moved to the Philippines, and it's been a heck of a nine years. And in that first couple of years, we were really praying about what type of church that we wanted to build. And like I said last week, we wanted to build a, a community and an environment where people felt safe to be imperfect, where people had a safe place to wrestle with the things of God and to work out their journey. And as we began to build that safe place, something else struck me. For those that don't know, I was born here in the Philippines. I have very white Australian and New Zealand parents, but I was born here, lived here as a missionary kid for many years as a child. And so there was a lot about Filipino culture that I knew and I understood when we moved here nine years ago, but uh, there were some things that I didn't realize because of my age and my immaturity. And as we began to meet people and as we began to grow the church, there was something that I had never realized or comprehended as a child, but became very clear to me about the general Filipino culture as an adult. And it was this, I was amazed with how many broken and dysfunctional families there are within our nation. And as I met more and more people, I realized just how lonely so many people were. And at the time, I understood it. Kate and I understood it. We had left everything that we knew in Australia. And even though I had grown up here, a lot of the people I grew up with weren't here anymore. And so we knew what it was like to be lonely. And so one day, it just came out. What's this church? Well, this church is the family that you've been looking for. And it's beautiful because this language of family is used so often throughout the Bible. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God. How? Through faith. And for all of you who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In this beautiful from Paul, he's saying here that we are God's children. We are sons and daughters of God, and he is our father. And there's no longer Jew, Gentile, woman, or man. There's no longer class A, B, C, D, or E. There's no longer the rich or the poor, or what college or you went to or didn't go to. There's no longer any of that. If you follow Jesus, you are now in the family of Christ. We are of Abraham's seed. You are now in line for an inheritance that you never earn. Come on, how many of y'all love an inheritance that you don't have to earn? We're in line for it. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 18, and I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. 
You may have had a terrible parent. Can I tell you, you've got the greatest parent of all, our Father in heaven. He has called you son. He has called you daughter. And Paul doubles down on this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9. He says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. Come on, that's a verse for me right now. You're no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. And also, what are you? Members of his household. So your sons and daughters, you're no longer man, woman, Jew, Greek, Gentile. You're a son, you're a daughter, and you are a member of God's household. And there is one giant household around the whole world. We call it the capital C church. There's one big family. You follow Jesus, I follow Jesus, we're all on the same family. When I grew up in church, come on, we got any old school people here that grew up in church? What we used to call everyone, hello sister. <laughs> Pastor Chap got saved under my parents. He still calls my mom today, hello sister Beverly. <laughs> everyone was sister and brother in church, why? Because we were just one big family. It didn't matter what church you went to, we're still brothers and sisters with our heavenly father all on the same family. But then I love it because just like there's a big extended family that you have, there's also more intimate families as well, and that's all the different churches. There's 17 different churches represented in Robinson's Galleria today. <laughs> we're all a part of the family, but we all got our family as well. And some of us get born into these families. Some of us move to these families. Some of us leave families for a while, but then get drawn back in and find their way home. But sometimes people can have the wrong perception of a family, the wrong perception of our church. Uh, I love James Jimena, who I mentioned before. And uh, Albie, Pastor Albie's his brother. And uh, Albie was praying for his brother to come to church, wanted him to know Jesus. Jesus had changed Albie's life. And so James came a few times, and it was when we were at Shangri-La, and he, he just didn't like it. He didn't like the church. He was upset because uh, he didn't like the way everyone dressed. He said, oui, social, right? He, he didn't like it. He said there was too much English in there. He felt, he felt like he didn't belong. He felt like there was maybe a family, but not one for him. And so he came a couple times, didn't, didn't come back, had a bad attitude towards it. He was looking for a wife, couldn't find a wife, so he left, right? <laughs> anyway, he ended up coming back, I think, for service, and he started talking with uh, one of our incredible leaders, Arnell, who's been in our church since we were 20 people in uh, our community service in Flair Towers. And when he began to talk to Arnell, he realized, oh, Maybe I've had the wrong perception on what this family is because Arnell began to share his story and how he felt a little bit out of place, but no, it wasn't really the correct per perception and how Arnell had found a family within here. Broke all the wrong perceptions that James had. He ended up coming to church. He ended up getting in a connect group. Can I tell you that one of the best things to do, if not the best thing to do in our church, is to get into a connect group? Because once James got in a connect group, he found family. He found people that loved him. He found people that walked the journey with him. He found people that would correct him. He found people that would pray with him. He found people that would walk on this, this sanctification journey with him. He gave his heart to Jesus. And you know what I love about James is that the very, this very wrong perception that he had, he ended up becoming a part of that, changing the narrative. And now... He is one of the best leaders that we have in our church. Everything that was done for him, he now does for other people. James is one of the best husbands. Oh, husbands, by the way, got himself a green card wife. He got himself, for the guy that didn't want to speak English, got a white girl. And they now take vacations to America together. Right? He ran out of blood. No more nosebleed. He just ran out. There is no more blood to bleed. Right? And he now, honestly, is one of the best husbands in our church. He sits with husbands, loves these, the men in his connect group, an incredible person, a part 
of our church. Could, could I maybe tell you that the family you've been looking for could be on the other side of a false perception? Mm, that's not their, you know, maybe they're just, mm. we've always had people, oh, this is just a church for young people. Really? Look around you. There's some old people in this room today. <laughs> I mean, there's some old people in this room. You don't look old. You all look so beautiful, huh? Maganda. But you are old. We know. Your birth certificate. You are old. Right? Don't let a false perception stop you from joining in with a family. Maybe it's time to join the family. Could I just, can we just put the connect? I, I know. We got a connect slide. I, I want us to put it up. Put the connect slide up. Here's the thing. If you're not in a connect group, can I just... So I want to know, how many people you feel like Connect Group has changed your life and, and has done something in you? There you go. See all those hands? For everyone watching online, there's a lot of hands that just went up. If you're not in a Connect Group, I want to encourage you, get into a Connect Group. We are about to start 190 new Connect Groups around Metro Manila in the next season because of the amount of people God's bringing into our church. And so I want to encourage you, if you're not a part of Connect Group, and if, if you're looking for a Connect Group in a certain part of Metro Manila and we don't have one, maybe you're the answer to start one in that part of Metro Manila. But it can be scary. It can be a little bit scary to get involved in a family. Do you know why? Because families are dysfunctional. Even the healthy, I, people talk about healthy families, health, man, even the healthiest families, there is still a level of dysfunction. Sometimes we get a bit afraid because we think, well, that dysfunction that I've seen in my family or somebody else's family, that's, that's going to be the same dysfunction that's going to be in church. There's going to be that same dysfunction in church. You know, I've been around some very healthy families and I've been around some very unhealthy families. And I've seen many of these traits, both healthy and unhealthy, reflected in church. So let's look at a couple of them. Uh, the first is this, healthy fun functional families, you know what they do? They show up for one another. They show up for one another. Let's look at the blueprint of New Testament church. Uh, we don't do church the way we do it because we went to some church seminar and we learned how to do church. The way we do church is actually the blueprint is found in Acts chapter 2. If you want to read the whole chapter, it's wonderful. They have the day of Pentecost. Peter preaches. It's amazing. 3,000 people get saved. And then it goes on and it talks about how the early church grew. Verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. So that's the large gathering. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. That's the small gathering, connect groups. And what did they do? Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. See, even our church's name it's in the blueprint of how to do church, right? And the Lord, what did the Lord do? Added to their number daily those who were being saved. What's the blueprint for church? You know what it is? It's doing life together. It's doing church together. But sometimes we got to think, okay, well, what's our definition of church? If we're going to do church together, what's our definition? What does church mean? Because you know what? COVID in the last few couple of years, it challenged people's perception on what church was. And what COVID showed me was that there was a lot of people that had the wrong perception of what church was. Let me tell you straight up what church isn't. No offense to all the people online that I'm about to talk to. Isn't it amazing when someone says no offense and then they proceed to offend you? <laughs> Isn't that a, my children right now, this is their new thing. They say not to be rude, but, and then they just say the most rude thing you've ever heard of in your life. So no offense to those right now watching online. God bless you. But church is not watching a service online. It's not. Do you know what that's called? That's called watching a service online. It's not church. Church is so much more than just the music and the preaching. You know what church is? Church is coming together to worship God 
together. It's devoting ourselves to the teaching of the leaders and following Jesus. Church is about breaking bread and eating with one another. It's about loving and helping one another. Do you know what church is? Church is about getting offended and then forgiving and then getting offended again and then learning how to forgive again. If you are in our church and you have not been offended by me or somebody else in the church, either you haven't been here long enough, just hold on, or number two, and this is probably the sadder reality, you haven't gone deep enough with anybody yet to actually be offended. Church, I love it. Because church gives us an opportunity to have to deal with our own character flaws. Church is about caring for people of all ages, from our children in kids' church all the way up to our beautiful seniors, our seasoned age group. Church is about serving others. Don't ever reduce church to just the music and the preaching. I've had people upset at me, right? They're upset because we do all the stuff in between the music and the preaching. They're like, you, do, you don't need to do that. Just, just go from the, the music to the preaching. The, the people are ready for the word. All that other stuff, it, you're just wasting time. And I remember the first time I heard that, I, I was so, I wasn't angry. I wasn't angry. This is about to be a father line. You ready for this? I wasn't angry. I was disappointed. I was disappointed because all that other stuff, giving finances to God, welcoming new people to the family, taking a minute to stand up and grab some candy because your breath smells, and meet someone you've never met before, finding out what's going on in church that will help you grow more, get more connected in, all that, all that stuff in the middle. Do you know what all that stuff is? That's family. And if church to you is just the music and the preaching, mm, maybe you're here today and you think that, yeah, all that stuff in the middle, I do it. could I challenge you that if you have that opinion, your frustration is probably birthed in the fact that you are a consumer that wants to attend a service rather than a person that wants to join a family and grow. And if you want to do that, God bless you. There's millions of churches on YouTube that you can go and watch their service. But I promise you, you may grow in head knowledge, but you won't grow in your character. How do you grow in your character? Not by head knowledge, but by walking with people beside you. That's how you grow. And that's what's beautiful about the church. Church is family. It's family. It's, it's not just a community of people. It's family. Uh, Don Jimena. Pastor Don, Pastora Don, is our GM. She's an amazing, smart woman. And she said that when she first came to our church years ago, that she'd grown up around church her, her whole life. Uh, she'd been in Baguio. Uh, she's a, uh, in, an Igorot tribal person. Uh, and so she grew up in the mountains and the tribes up there. And, and so she'd grown up around church and everything her whole life. And she sat in our church and she said, I've always known church was a community, but the first time I saw that line, the family you've been looking for, something hit her. She was living alone here in Manila. Uh, she was lonely. She didn't have a boyfriend, <laughs> which became Albie, uh, right? She was lonely, and she said that she'd grown up, and she'd known church was a community her whole life, but family just hit deeper than a community, right? Like we all live in communities, right? Our barangays, we all live in our communities, but they all don't live in my house. My family lives in my house, and there was something that hit her, and she said from that day on, she decided, first day she came to our church, she goes, this is going to be my new home, and I am so glad that she said yes. Come on, how many of y'all are glad that Dawn made this her home? I am. We appreciate you, Dawn. The confronting reality about being in a church family is that it is so much more than just a service. And modern day church has become so much about convenience 
live streaming as much as I love it. God bless you. I don't want to be rude, but... <laughs> But our live streaming, as much as I love live streaming, live streaming is great for people that are sick, people that are traveling, people that have never seen our service and they want to have like a sneaky date without committing to the church. They want to, all those things are good. But the other problem with live streaming our services is that it's just created spectator Christians that just sit and watch. Our Christian faith cannot start and end with singing and listening to preaching. It must include serving one another. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, it says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Listen, it does not say spur one another on to feeling loved and to feeling good. The spurring one another on is to actually do action, to love and to do good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The writer in Hebrews here, he's telling us, hey, don't give up meeting. And this was a core verse for our church during COVID. You remember this? We, this was a core. We didn't want to give up meeting with one another. But he's encouraging you. Don't just, oh, I love you. That's fine. Anyone can say that you love someone. It's a lot harder to show that you love someone. And he's saying, spur one another on. I'm not just going to love and do good deeds. I'm going to spur my family sitting next to me. Hey, come with me. Let's go and help this person. Hey, come with me. Let's go to connect group together. Hey, come with me. Let's get inner healing with Rachel Kimmel together. Come on. Come with me. I'm going to spur you on. Loving people and doing good deeds requires more than just sitting in a service and being fed. It requires us to live the way Jesus lived. In the same book, in a different book in Galatians, Paul writes, chapter 6, verse 9, Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us, what? Do good. To all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. When you begin to serve in this house, when you begin to come to church, not just for yourself, but looking, how can I help? How can I love other people? You know what you've done? You've just signed up to be a part of building the family of God. And people are looking for family. There's one young girl in our church that came to our very first family conference we did in 2019, I think it was, and, and uh, she said that she was kind of church hopping a little bit. She'd moved from a different part of Metro Manila, and at that conference, she just, she saw, again, the tagline, the family you've been looking for, and she goes, I think this is the family I've been looking for, got planted in the church in 2020, the next year. She began to have a really tough season with her family. She was forced to leave her house with only the clothes that she had on. And in that time, she was actually preparing to be disowned completely by her family. There were some amazing people in our church that took her in, that helped her, gave her space to grieve and to heal in that situation. This is what she said. I actually want to read it. She said, I appreciated how much of a family church should be like. Caring, non judgmental, and accepts you for who you are, but never lets you stay in the mud. I love that. She went on to say that after five days, the people from church offered to drive her back to her family, heal what had been broken, and now this young girl is in a great relationship with her family, and she's a core member of our church serving and loving people now the same way that she was loved when she came in. Don't tell me church is just a service. It is so much more. It's a family of people who are worshiping Jesus together, serving him with one an another. You want to be a part of a church? Could I encourage you? Show up for one another. Show up. You know what else have healthy families have? Healthy families have clear authority. One of the hardest things I think is to be in an environment, especially where there's groups of people where there's no clear line of authority and people don't know who the leaders are. Let, let's talk bluntly. When it comes to family, there's many people in this room and watching that have grown up with unhealthy authority. 
particularly unhealthy male authority or unhealthy overbearing female authority in the home. There's also other people that have unfortunately, and it breaks my heart to say this, but have been under unhealthy church leadership. Church leadership that's been spiritually abusive or manipulative. And even right now, as I begin to talk about this, you are tensing up right now, just waiting to be triggered. I I get it. I get it. It's tough. But can I tell you this? Just because you have one bad dinner doesn't mean you give up on eating forever. And in a healthy family, there is a healthy and clear line of authority. In my house, everybody in my house knows that I am the head of my house. And there's a safety in that. My wife honors me, and she submits, and she respects me most of the time in my house. (laughs) She honors, no, every single time she honors and respects me. Uh, she submits to me eventually. The key word is eventually. <laughs> if, is that fair to say, sweetheart? Eventually. Eventually is the key. Eventually is a healthy word that has kept us married for 16 years. <laughs> eventually, right? There's a clear line in our house. Who the, my kids know who their leader is in the house. I was joking about this with Tally the other day, but my, my kids one time, I think we're sitting around the table, and they started going, James, James, Pastor James, right? And they're like, (laughs) and I went, stop it. I said, there's three people in this world that get to call me dad. I said, everybody else calls me Pastor James, or spiritual father, (laughs) or ex-male model, whatever you want to call, but I said, there's three people in this world that call me dad. You are the only three people in this world that biologically get to call me dad. It's an honor. Don't abuse that. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, dad. (laughs) The only other thing they're allowed to call me is the big dog because that is kind of a cool name (laughs) as well. They call me big dog. But in my family, they know there's a clear line of authority in my house, right? If a robber comes into my home, guess what? Women, children behind me, I'm going to stand there. Why? Because I'm the leader of my house. Healthy and clear authority. You know what it does? Healthy and clear authority in a family, particularly in a church, it provides safety and clarity. It does. When I get on a plane, I I, I travel for work and for church. When I get on a plane, I don't want any vagueness about who's in charge of that plane. When I get on the plane, I don't want to be working out Who's flying? Is it you? Is it you? Is the hostess flying the plane? No, no. I want the captain to be there with the wings, with the hat. I want to know who's in charge. It makes me feel safe when I see a captain that looks like a captain. You know what I'm saying? Not like an 18-year-old kid that's like, hey, I'm flying for the first time. I'm getting off the plane. If that, I want to walk in and see someone with a cl- I want that voice to come over. <clears throat> oh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I want to hear the depth in the voice. Like you have been through puberty. You are an older person. I feel safe when there's a clear line of authority. And could I put it to you that if we could move past maybe the wounds, maybe we need inner healing, which we're going to do a grow class on, but if we could move past the wounds of past abuse and we could come into a place of going, okay, God, oh, okay, this is a little bit new, but I'm willing to give it a shot, then maybe you could walk into a place not of pain, but of safety. We talk about this so much in our church. Last Wednesday night, we had the best family night we've ever had. The, the whole podium hall was packed out. We're going to have to have a bigger venue now. Oh, Jesus, give us a building, right? And we, we need a bigger venue now for our, for our, our family night. It's too small now. And, and so what we talked about on family night was what are the requirements of leadership that Paul writes to Timothy about in 1 Timothy chapter 3. But instead of using it as a checklist to walk around and go, I'm better than you. Look at me. I'm above reproach. I am a man of one wife. I am not a drunkard. I do not steal. Instead of looking at it that way, Paul's 
actual revelation comes from the love that Jesus had for the people he served. The leaders in our house, you don't serve us, we serve you. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And the motivation of leadership is not to feel better than anyone, it's actually the love of people. There have been people here since midnight setting up this church because they love you and they want to serve you. But it's good to have clear lines of leadership. We don't want to have manipulative, toxic leadership, codependent leadership relations. We want to be signposts that point people to Jesus. It's healthy to have leadership that brings correction and to bring leadership when it's needed. And when it's done in a healthy way, when love is the motivation, it will bring comfort and safety. It will not trigger anxiety. And if you do get triggered today, I believe God can heal you today in this place. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, it says this, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Have confidence in your leaders, submit to their authority. And to be honest, time will always tell whether your leader's producing good fruit. It will. Some people have come, they read that, and they go, okay, that's a, great, that's a great verse for favorite church, but what if I'm in a church where I do have a manipulative pastor, and I do have a manipulative leader? Okay, I get it. I understand. I understand there may be people like that, unfortunately. But over time, if you see that, and if you see the bad fruit growing, then you need to have good boundaries, and you need to remove yourself from that. We had a lady come to our church, and she'd come from a very spiritual and uh, a, a very spiritually abusive and manipulative background just basically showed up to our church broken. And she saw the tagline, and in her head she thought, mm, is this just going to be a tagline or is it going to be something real? And the longer that she was in our church, the more she realized, oh, this isn't just a tagline. This isn't some cute little marketing ploy that they have but people within the church actually became family. And the longer that she was in church and the longer that she was under leadership, the, the more healed she became. Sometimes healing takes time. Sometimes God can do it in a moment. Sometimes God can do it over a 10-week you know, uh, session with a psychologist, or sometimes you just need to be in healthy soil over time to let healthy fruit grow in your life. And she eventually got to the point where God healed her of her former spiritual abuse and manipulative abuse from former leaders. And now she is in our church. She's a leader in our church. She loves people in our church. And she proudly says, ah, it's not a tagline. It's who we are as a church. Now, are there going to be some weird people here? Okay, let me ask you this question. Are there weird people in your family? If you answered no, you're the weird one. Right? We all got weird titos and titas. Come on. Some of you just thought of them right now. Some of us have annoying siblings. We all got weird people. Some of our parents, ah, the cousins are weird. You know, we all have weird people in our family. Can I ask you this question? Are you best friends with everybody in your extended family? No, you're not. But there's something special about family. And what I found is I don't need to be best friends with you to show up and be with you and to help you. And in our church, yeah, there's going to be some weird people in our church. I'm one of those weird people. But being family means that we show up when it matters. It means as well that we place boundaries to make sure that we're being healthy. And with some unhealthy family members, we will create boundaries to make sure that people feel safe within this family. But we're going to walk the journey. No church is perfect. Amen? No church is perfect. Neither is any family. So walk the journey with us. The last thing I see that healthy families have is they've got people who take responsibility for the family. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I think the guys have it on the screen. They can put it up. But it's a, this is a very famous scripture, especially when it comes to church. And Paul's talking here. Uh, 
basically describing the church. The church is not the organization. The church is the ecclesia, the called out ones. It's people. Church is actually people. It's not an organization. Favored church, we have a legal organization with the SEC here in the Philippines, but that's not the church. The church is you. The church is me. Look, look to your neighbor right now. You are the church. That's, that's what the church is. And so Paul's talking so beautifully about the church. And he's talking about how the church essentially is a body and how in a body, uh, we need every part of our body. And our body is so useful. A lot of times you don't realize how useful something is until you lose it, right? And there's some things you can lose on your body and you can keep operating, but really everything matters in your body. And so he uses his example talking about the body. Just as the body, though, has many parts, but also its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Here, again, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, whether class A, B, C, D, E, we were all given the one spirit to drink. So he's basically saying, ah, there's not one part that's better than the other. The foot is not better than another part of the body. The eye is no better. All this, he's basically going on and saying, all these things, they need one another. He gets down, verse 22. It says, on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. Can I tell you that you and I, we are each a part in this body. And again, I look at the big body and I look at the small body. Favor church is a part of the big body of believers. God has a special task for us as corporately as favor church. And I believe we're beginning to step into it and walk into it already in our season. We want to be a church that helps other churches, raises up leaders, church plants, it, it is an influence in this nation. And so we have a purpose as a part of the big body, but within our small body, each one of us has a purpose. You are a toe, you are a finger, you're a lung, you're a heart, you're an intestine, you're a mouth, you're an ear, you're a nose, you're a hair. Some of you are hair. Some of you are bold, but you are the hair of our church. God's redeeming what you've lost and bringing it back. You are the hair of our church. Right? We all have a piece to play in this church, and one is not more important than the other at all. What is not more important? Some may think, oh, what you do, James, you're the most important one because you preach on the microphone. Listen, I get it. I know I'm the pastor. I know I preach. But uh, without these dudes here on the side and little guy there called Dan, these guys turn up at 11. Is it 11 or 11.30 the night before? 11 o'clock. And they start getting all this. I mean, do you think like leprechauns set this up in the morning and we just come? They're here, 11 p.m., start setting everything up. They have amplification so that I can have a microphone. And they're never on stage, but without them, people in the back ain't going to hear me. Our guys that get here at 5 a.m., all volunteers, these guys, all volunteers get here at 5 a.m., and, and they start setting up the cameras, right? These two girls here have been filming me. The whole time, I don't even know who you are. I can't even see your faces. Oh, hi, mate. I see you, right? These two girls are here filming. Got a young man here on the side. Like, they've been standing. While y'all lazy have been sitting for the last 45 minutes, they've been standing, and, and they're filming. So it might be great what I'm saying, but it's useless if it can't be filmed and given out to other people, right? Those chairs that you're sitting on, fantastic. How long are you going to keep coming to church if you don't have a chair to sit on? Someone got here early and set out those chairs for you. Your children right now, oh, thank Jesus my children aren't in this room right now or else you'd be hearing my son the whole time. But there's some amazing people that got here at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., started setting up a whole kids' church down the road. Like this stuff doesn't happen. We all have a part to play. There's a guy in our church called Jason Max, and uh, I love Jason. His wife, Micah, 
is our creative uh, director over our whole church. She does amazing, and he basically voluntarily helps her run the entire, entire thing. Uh, Max came to our church the last night that we did a connect group in Astoria Plaza at the end of 2015. He showed up and he didn't really understand what was happening. And I had an anointing service in there. And so I anointed him and prophesied over him and he was freaking out, he didn't know what to do. But Max became our first music director. I sat down with him, I drove my motorbike to UP and we sat in the amphitheater bit of UP near the naked statue and we sat there uh, together. And I asked questions, why, why is he naked? And uh, he, he didn't know the answer. And so we sat there together and he basically, I asked him, would you really join our church? He goes, yeah. But you know what I love about Max? Here's the thing, again, like some people, some people want to reduce church to this. It's not. Do you know what our church is? Our church is Max who would, brother, he, he, who would borrow his sister or his parents' car. He lived up in Katapunan at the time in QC. And he would drive to church and then he would drive people all the way home to Makati, sometimes out to Antipolo, just to make sure that they got home. When there was not a lot of people in the church, he would just drive everyone ever. In fact, there's a girl in our church and one of the reasons why she's in our church is because she was so impacted by the way that he would go out of his way to drive people everywhere and to go around. Like this stuff just doesn't happen. Chairs, let's talk about chairs. We talked about chairs. In Shangri-La, we ordered 400 chairs from China, right? 400 chairs from China showed up in the basement of Shangri-La. And we had to get them, it was on a Friday, we had to get them ready for church on a Sunday. Uh, 400 chairs, and there wasn't a lot of people serving and helping in our church at the time, but there were some great people. John and Tally were one of them. They weren't married, they were dating at the time. Arnell and Belle, I think, had just gotten married. They met me, and the five of us, was only, it was only the five of us, wasn't it? The five of us spent the next three, four hours until about 1.30 a.m., once the mall closed, getting 400 chairs from a container, walking it to the elevator, bringing it up, and bringing it inside the church. We got a beautiful photo somewhere of that, of us doing it, right? No fanfare. Y'all don't even know that story, but it happened. And if we didn't do that, we wouldn't have a church. The next day, we had a bunch of people, 25 people came in and screwed all those chairs together. Evidently, if you've sat on those chairs in Shangri-La, they didn't do a great job. <laughs> right? But they did it, and we had chairs in Shangri-La. Like, that's, that's us that's people playing a part of the body. Jake Shepard, who married Tammy, who's now our youth pastor in our Brisbane family during COVID, would go out and deliver new people bags physically when everyone was scared to go out. He would drive to all parts of the city. It only took him seven minutes because there was no cars on the road, but he would drive to all parts of the city for people that had signed up to new, for new people that had been watching online, and he would hand deliver those bags. Do you know how many people were touched, blown away with the fact that a, a white kid would drive in the middle of COVID to go and hand deliver a bag. Albie and a beautiful girl, Kat Karandang, uh, uh, they, they started feeding people in the middle of COVID. One to 3,000 families a week, they created a team. We were able to borrow ICS Church in Greenfield, a part of the big capital C family, incredible church down there. They would let us during COVID go in and put all the food in there. And then we would go out and Albie and this team began to develop. This, COVID guys, this is when no one was going out. They were walking out through the streets of Mandaluyong down in addition hills, sometimes up in Rizal, sometimes different, feeding one to 3,000 families a week. That's church. It's not just my preaching. That's, that's church. That's what church is like. That's, that's, that's more. And so when you say, oh, just get rid of all that stuff in the middle, we don't need to hear the announcements. Really? I want to see what we did during the flood. Because that's church. When Favor Care went and fed people, that's, that's as much church as it is me preaching to you. Because you're not just coming to a service. You've joined a family, and it's not a cult. Believe me, it's not a cult. We ain't a cult. The only reason why this family exists is not because of me. Don't come and kiss my ring. It's gross. It's unhygienic. Stop it. 
I'm at the door, some people grabbing my hand to kiss. I'm like, get away! I'm not the Pope, right? No one does that. That's a joke. But here's the thing. We're not here because of me. We're all here because of Jesus. That's why we're here. That's why we're a family. It's because of Jesus. And some of you that know the Bible, you're waiting. You're waiting right now. You know the Bible. You're like, is he going to say it? Is he going to say it? How could he preach a whole sermon on family and he hasn't said it? Is he going to say it? Well, I'm going to say it. Because in Psalm chapter 68, verse 5, it says, A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. And you know what it says? God sets the lonely in family. He leads out the prisoners. Come on, we got some prisoners that are in our church today because they got let out of CIW. I got some on my staff. Leads them out with singing. God sets the lonely in family. Maybe you've got a great family, and so you don't need a family in church. I get it. I understand it. But could I put it to you? I actually think you need a family in church. May not understand it yet. And this is what I don't want to do. I don't want you to realize it just because you go through a hard time. Because that's a lot of times is when we realize it. But wouldn't it be great if you could realize you need a family when everything's going well? And you can be there for other people as well. Listen, this is a, this sermon is Kate and I, it's our life for the last nine years. It's this sermon. We came here and we didn't really know a lot of people at all. And we had Ray and Cherry that were part of the church, but they lived down in Las Piñas and, and, you know, so it was hard to hang out a lot of times. And another random guy called Kevin, he's a great guy, he found us online. So... We began to build the church, but we were very lonely. Has anyone else ever been lonely? Right? We were lonely. It was tough. It was tough for Kate. Kate had never lived in a foreign country. She'd visited. I mean, the Philippines. I love the Philippines. But if you've, if you've lived in the suburbs of Australia your whole life, it's hard for a white, blonde-haired woman sometimes to just move straight up out here with a little baby. Kate would go to the mall, and people would just come and start touching Hope when she was a baby. And Kate's like, what are you doing? Stop touching my baby. It, it, it was all weird and confronting, and people would just look at Kate. They would just go. <laughs> right? And so it, she never experienced that. So it was, it was weird kind of stood out a little bit and we had new people coming coming to church but you know sometimes it does take a little bit of time right and, but as I think of our journey I think about just how how much this little tagline is actually our story because nine years later September it's when we moved here nine years later next month I sit there and I look at people like Max and Micah, who have become family to us. I look at people like John and Tally and Arnell and Bell. Arnell and Bell got engaged in our condo, and we all watched together as a family. Bell helped us with our children when we first moved here because we didn't know anyone. We didn't have any physical family here. We couldn't trust anyone with our kids, and so Bell and Arnell, they just became family to us. Don and Elby, I talked about Don. Liz showed up. I could go through all my staff. Paul came and became family, and Janine later on, and, and all these people within our team and, and our extended family. And now, now when I stand on the front door on a Sunday and I give hugs to people, oh, I'm giving hugs to brothers and sisters, to titos and titas, to fathers, to mothers. Lolos, Lolas, to kids, spiritual children, whatever it is. And I can honestly tell you that I feel like the most blessed man in the world that I get to be a part of this family. And our church, listen to me, it is no better than any other church at all. Because I know the church at the end of the hallway is an amazing family. I know the church at the other end of the mall, they are an amazing family. And I'm sure their pastor stands out in the front and gives hugs to the kids and to the titas and to the titos. Even if the titas grab my stomach and call me fat, I still love you. 
I'm doing something about it, but I still love you. <laughs> this is our journey. We, we found a family. And so I just want to say, I've never, it's a weird way to end a service, sermon, but I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being our family. My parents moved here about a year and a half ago, so it's really nice. I now have physical family here, but one day they'll die. <laughs> My dad's actually watching at home as well. Dad, please not soon, but one day they will. And so we'll, we'll probably go back to no, no physical family, but thank you for being our family. And thank you for putting up with well, thank, thank you for putting up with a lot of the mistakes that we've made. Like you don't give up on family when they make a mistake, do you? That's weird, they're family. So thank you, thank you when we have fallen short for sticking around. Thank you for encouraging us when we've done good things and for encouraging us when we haven't done good things. Thank you for having a great spirit. Thank you for loving my children like your own, for many of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for not just saying you're a part of it, but for many of you that actually financially give into this house to make it what it is. Thank you for trying to avoid gossip. Thank you for serving. Thank you for not allowing offense to grow into a tree in your life that creates a fence that keeps people out. But thank you for being humble enough to seek forgiveness or to apologize or to work things out. Thank you. Because that's what you do in a healthy family. And it's made easier when we know why we are a family. I didn't get to choose my mom. She didn't get to choose me. God, did. it just happened. But I do get to choose my church family. And I made a decision that come hell or high water, that this is my family, I'm going to stick around. So if we fight, I'm going to fight for a resolution. If there's stuff going on, we're going to be here. Why? Because we're an imperfect church, a church for imperfect people. But we're also a church that's a family. And maybe you found a family. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus today, I want to tell you, the greatest thing about being a part of this family, the, the church, big capital C church around the world, is, is who our leader is. Oh. Our leader, you got to understand, right? So many times we get this picture of King Jesus, Jesus victorious, Jesus on a white horse, Jesus, Jesus. But do you know what is the, you want to know the, I believe the greatest picture of who Jesus is, is Jesus on the cross. Because Jesus on the cross, bloodied, whipped, beaten, bruised, hanging by nails. That picture to me, it shows me the depth of love that he has for me. Following Jesus is not about following a bunch of rules. It's about following someone who loved you so much that he chose humanity, emptied himself to come to this earth. So that he would be put on a cross one day so that we our sins that have separated from god us from god that he would forgive our sins and we could come into a relationship with god some of you are like well who, who do i worship jesus or god it's the same jesus is god you want to know who god is look at jesus on the cross that is god not a defeated person but a person full of love welcoming you and you. There's a story that Jesus tells called, we've labeled it the prodigal son. It's in the book of Luke, I think Luke chapter 15. And he tells a story of a child who runs away from home. He grabs his inheritance, goes away and parties it up, loses everything and he comes back home. And says that as he's in a far off distance, the father sitting on the porch looking, waiting runs to his son. The son's got this speech prepared. He's going to give a speech of, oh, dad, you know, I just make me like one of the servants. I don't deserve to be here. I, all these things I've done, I treated you poorly. And the dad just ignores him. 
ignores what he says and says, you are my son, puts a robe on him, gives him a signet, a, a ring, not just a ring to look nice, but a signet ring which identifies him as a son of the house. But I love the picture that the father is on the porch waiting for the son. Watching, watching. Jesus told that story as a picture of what God is right now. He's waiting. And he's waiting. Maybe you're here, you don't have a relationship. Maybe you don't follow Jesus. Well, well God the Father is waiting, going, I'm here. I want to throw a beautiful robe on you. I want to put the rings on your finger. I know you've done some crazy stuff. I've seen it all. But I love you, and I want to be here with you. So if you're here today, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're watching online, and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You can do this as well. I want us all just to bow our heads, close our eyes. If you're saying, James, that's me. I've never done this before. I've never come to a place where I've acknowledged Jesus and want to follow him. Maybe you're here, you did this a long time ago, but you left church. Life happened, stuff happened, and you left, but you're back today. I'm, I'm so glad that you're here. I want to give you a chance to respond, not to me, not to this church, but to respond to our Heavenly Father. So if you're saying, James, that's me, I'm that first person, I've never done this, or James, I'm that second person, I did this a long time ago. When I count to three, I'd love you to lift your hand nice and high because we want to pray for you right where you sit today. One, two, three. Right now, all over this room, you lift your hands. Thank you so much here. Hands here. Hands in the middle here. Thank you, Jesus. Hands up in the back corner. Thank you so much. Hands up in the middle in the back. Thank you. Here, a couple of hands in the middle section over here. Thank you, Lord. If you're at home, you're watching, you can just lift your hands wherever you are. God sees. That's what matters the most. Beautiful. If you lifted your hand, this is what I want you to do. I want you to put your hand on your heart right now. We're, we're going to pray a simple prayer together. There's nothing magical about this prayer, but it's just some words that we say that really reflect what's happening on the inside of our heart right now. It kind of gives us language for this moment that we're having with God. So I want you to say this prayer with me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, come on, we're all going to say it together. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, come to you right now, and I ask you to forgive my sin. I believe that you died on the cross. Thank you for dying on the cross. But you defeated death and you rose victorious. So right now, Jesus, I choose to follow you. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I love you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give God praise for every person?